is Mr. Carter from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for being here. We appreciate your attendance. Mr. Wiseke, I'm going to start with you. You testified before this committee, I believe, before the subcommittee in February of 2017 and talked about how states could improve our, our health care system and the role that they could play in improving it. Beyond reinsurance, what, um, what are some ways that you think that um, we could use stability funds to, to help patients in the exchange marketplace? Yeah, I, I think from from the perspective that I came from then and the perspective that I come from now, I think there are ways to design more affordable benefit options for consumers to add some flexibility. I think there's ways to uh, provide some, some risk sharing. I think if you look at, at some of the issues that we've seen with younger folks who are not signing up for coverage, I mean, we may have 13 carriers in the state of Wisconsin, but they're regional. Um, and, and in some cases, we're seeing you no know, younger folks signing up because of value propositions, redesigning those sort of subsidies. I think re-looking at the way um, we, you know, the cost-sharing reduction subsidy issue related to whether or not you use, um, you know, payments or whether or not you use an account-based solution that would provide some value to a consumer. Um, I think there are ways to sort of, uh, uh, you know, for states to become laboratories of democracy and experiment and find out what, what the best solution would be, similar to the way Massachusetts started. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Let, let's move on to the state-based exchanges bill, one that, that we're discussing here. I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that you, um, of, this, of the 12 state-based exchanges, that, that you said that only half of them received, a, that over half of them received a D or an F grade. Is that correct? Yeah, I think we had some issues with um, with the level of information that's available to the exchanges, and this is part of the reason why we support looking at some private uh, some private competitive uh, versions in the state and new ways to enroll. That um, you know what we're looking at now is different than what we looked at in 2014, and time has moved on for a, a lot of a lot of the ways consumers shop. And I believe you said that almost three fourths of them were were worse or scored worse than the federal exchanges. Yeah, and, and, and we are seeing that, you know, states are certainly making efforts to improve, um, but it's a very expensive process, um, and it's very intensive, and the people who are bearing the cost of those uh, in, in a lot of cases, either the state through general tax revenue, or more likely it's through the consumers who are purchasing coverage for the exchange for access to that website. Okay. All right, let's move on and talk about the navigators. Um, in 2017, we spent $62.5 million on navigator grants, and it yielded us only a 1% increase in ACA enrollment out of those grants. That doesn't seem like it's a very efficient use of money to me. Again, what, what we've seen in, in other lines of insurance and in other places is that there are different ways for people to get access to coverage. So it's not just... That. So I think navigators are an important, uh, small, important piece of that, that to, to do outreach for underserved uh, consumers. But consumers are buying their coverage in different ways. Any 22-year-old, 27-year-old is not going to go into a navigator in the same way other folks are. Right. And same thing in rural areas. Am I correct? Correct. Correct. So, so that, that is really something we need to be concentrating on, younger, younger people as, as well as our rural areas. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, Mr. Chairman, and, and I realize you're sitting in for the chairman, so, but I, I do have to get this on record. And that is, here we are in our third hearing in the, in the subcommittee that has the broadest jurisdiction over health care of any subcommittee in Congress. And yet, already, the Oversight and Reform Committee has had a drug pricing hearing. The Ways and Means Committee has had a drug pricing hearing. And they're on their second one this week. The Senate Finance Committee has had two hearings. And this week, the Senate Committee on Aging is having two hearings on drug pricing. Now, this committee, the, the, the Energy and Commerce Committee, has a record of working in a bipartisan fashion. We, we've come up with cures. We've come up with 21st century cures. We've come up with a number of different things in a bipartisan fashion. Can you give me a, an idea, or, or at least relate to the chairman, an idea of when we're going to start talking about drug pricing that impacts all yes, Americans sir. and yes, is sir. a bipartisan issue? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I recognize you're the one pharmacist in our yes, sir. committee, so I appreciate your concern. It reminds me of a scene in The Karate Kid where the master told, uh, told the karate kid, 
Patience, Daniel son. Patience. <laughs> Uh, drug pricing will be a priority in this committee. In fact, uh, the first hearing is going to be next week, and, uh, and we're going to tackle this issue straight on, and you're going to be gleaming with happiness when we do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. <laughs> Daniel Sung. <laughs> Great. Um, next. Um